I want you to take your Bibles this morning, if you will, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Habakkuk. I want to read from Habakkuk, the second chapter, and the second verse. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come, and it will not tarry. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. I pray, dear Lord, that you will quicken my own heart and my spirit, Lord, to just receive of you. And as I receive of you, Lord, to give it to this congregation this morning, and I'll give you the glory, the honor, and the praise, because I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. When you think about Habakkuk, you think of a minor prophet. But when you listen to his message, there's nothing minor about his message. It's major. There's just three chapters in this book, and we're going to look at all three chapters this morning. And this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject of how to stay together when the world's coming apart. Everybody needs to hear that today. Let me tell you something, my friend. I don't know whether you're watching the news or whether you've got your ear to the ground, but this world is unraveling. I've lived a few years in my life. This world is coming apart. It's winding down. The end of all things is at hand. Listen to me this morning. And I'm afraid that it's going to end in calamity. And uh, now when I say that, I'm talking about the world system, and we live here, and we're a part of this world system. We know in our hearts that Jesus is coming again and that we're going to go up in the rapture. I hope you know that. The next great event on God's calendar is the rapture. And we know that after the rapture of the church, there's going to be a period on this earth that's going to be called the Great Tribulation. And uh, there's something that I just want to say because I think here in America we have... uh, We have gotten a, a false notion or a false idea about God's opinion of this nation. We live in America, and we think that somehow America is God's darling child. And because we're Christians and because we're Americans, we feel like, well, God would never allow trouble to come upon us. God would never allow calamity to come to this nation. And always God's going to say that we're going to live to a certain degree of tranquility and peace and And we're going to live this way in America until the rapture comes and we're all taken away. And therefore, we're not going to know any trouble and we're not going to know any tribulation. Let me just say to you, my friend, um, I don't believe we're going to go through the great tribulation. And that's going to be hell here on this earth. I don't know how much you know about that. That's when hell's going to have a holiday and the Antichrist is going to reign for some time. But let me tell you something else. The Bible says there's some other shadows that are going to come and it's going to cast event, it's going to cast a shadow upon the events that are to come. Now, what do you mean by that, Pastor Loper? Well, when Jesus was talking about the Great Tribulation, he mentioned certain terrible things, and he said, When these things begin, this will be the beginning of sorrows in Mark the thirteenth chapter and the eighth verse. These are the birth pains. We're going to go through a period that's known as the birth pains. It's the beginning of sorrows. And even though we will not enter into the great tribulation, I will tell you this, we're going to be living in an age in which we're going to see and experience things that we've never experienced before in this beginning of sorrows. I believe that is already happening. I believe it's happening nationally, and I believe it's happening internationally. And I want to say to many of us in this building this morning, I believe that We're living in a period where where this beginning of sorrow, there's going to be a judgment of of pestilence and famine and war, and, and, and we're going to have a period of time where we're going to look around and say, my Lord, what in the world is going on? It seems as if the whole world is out of control. Some of you, if you were honest with me this morning, you would say, Pastor Loper, already I'm having my own private tribulation. We all know financial problems. We all know heartaches. Some of you are experiencing sorrow. You're you're experiencing trouble and all kinds of distress. And 
And when trouble comes, sometimes we say, oh God, come on the scene very quickly and take it away. And uh, when God doesn't answer in the timetable that we think he should have answered, then we get on this threshold of stumbling. Uh, you know, you're sick and you're hurting and you say, God, I want you to heal me and I want you to heal me right now. And when God doesn't heal you according to that timetable, then suddenly your mind gets in a, a speed gear and begins to rev up and, and the devil begins to whisper to you that, that if he's really God, then evidently he doesn't care about you. And if he's really God, then he's not able to do anything about the situation that you're in. Because if he was God, he would respond to your pleas. And even if there is a God, uh, he's too weak to do anything about it. And some of you, when he begins to whisper all of these lies into your ears, you're tempted to think that what he's saying is true. Sometimes you begin to ask, where is God? You cry out in your spirit, in your heart, and say, where is God? Why doesn't God do something? I'm talking about people who are Christians, who've been Christians for a long time, who are suddenly walking through a quagmire that they don't understand, and they're saying, God, where are you at? Why don't you do something? You know, it used to be that we had a difficulty in believing in the Bible because we thought there was a conflict between Bible and science. So we always were trying to rationalize and bring together science and the Bible. But that's not the problem today. The, the problem in many Christians' lives today is, is not the Bible and science, but it's the Bible and history. We're having a trouble with history. Uh, if, if God is God, then why is this world in the mess that it's in? If God is God, then read your newspaper. How can I believe in God when there's so much war, there's so much crime, there's so much strife and murder and hunger and pride and drugs are running rampant? Did you see the documentary of what's happening uh, with our coast down in Mexico? A and we're acting like it's not happening, but now we're, we're in a war w that involves billions of dollars where, where people are being killed every day on the border with Mexico. It's unbelievable what's happening to this country. This country that we thought was safe and secure. So much war, so much crime, so many drugs, so much strife, so much murder and hunger and pride. Where is God? Doesn't God care? Is he too weak? Is, is God there at all? That's a problem with some people. And so on this scene this morning as I was asking myself what God would say to us today. God brought me to the book of Habakkuk. And I want you to just stay in tune with the book of Habakkuk today. Keep, keep, would you just keep your Bibles open to the book of Habakkuk? Keep it in your lap today. Because I want you to see this morning that even through the dark times of your life, that God is still God. I want you to see that God is still in His heavens. God is still on His throne. God has not lost control of this world. God cares about you. God has a plan for you. That's what I want you to see this morning. If you don't walk out of this building with anything else, I want you to walk out of this building with that ringing in your ears and resonating in your heart that God is still in control and He knows what's going on in your world and in your life. First of all, I want us to look at the perplexing problem. The book of Habakkuk is actually divided into three divisions. Chapter 1 is the perplexing problem. Chapter 2 is, is this proper perspective that he finally gained. And then chapter 3 is this profound praise that finally resonated in his heart. Now I want you to see something. The book begins with a burden. The, the book begins with a problem. The book begins in chapter 1, verse 1, with the saying, the burden which Habakkuk the problem did, the prophet did see. The burden which Habakkuk the prob, prophet did see. Now here is a man with a crushed heart. And here is a man with a deep, deep burden. Now what's his burden? His burden is, first of all, that God seems to be indifferent. Have you ever thought in your heart, God's indifferent to my situation? O Lord, how long shall we cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. There's a problem in the land, Lord. There's a lot of violence here. And God, I've been praying. I've been praying for a long time. I've prayed and prayed and prayed and, and even prayed some more. And seemingly there's no answer here whatsoever. 
Rather than the situation getting better, Lord, the situation seems to be getting worse. And he says, God, how long am I going to have to cry out to you? And in verse 2, he says it again. He uses the word cry twice. I want you to look at it. Now, the first word cry in the first verse, it is a plea for help. But the second word is a different Hebrew word that I looked up, and it means to shout or to scream. So now he's gone from pleading with God, and now he's screaming at God. He is shouting at God. God, are you deaf? Why don't you do something? He's almost angry. He's screaming out. He's pleading for help. It seems as if the heavens are, are, are brass. The heavens are silent. Have you ever been that way in your life where you did not think God was listening to your situation? Have you ever had a problem? Have you ever been to a, a place where you just wanted to start shouting at God? I've been there before. You want to argue with God a little bit? God, why don't you just do something? There doesn't seem to be an answer. How long, Lord, am I going to have to pray about this thing over and over again and over again? So first of all, God seemed to be indifferent. Secondly, God seems to be inactive. It seems like if God's up there, he's got his arms folded, and he's not doing a single thing about the situation. Verse three and, verses 3 and 4. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are raised up strife and contentions. Therefore the law is slack, and judgments doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Lord, have you noticed? Have you looked down here lately? This world's in a mess. That's what that text says. There's violence everywhere. You know, Jeremiah was a contemporary of Habakkuk. And listen to what he said in, 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 in his writings in the 8th chapter, the 12th verse. He, he was living at the same time. He says, were they shame when they committed these abominations? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, and neither could they blush. He said, we are now living in a society of unblushable people. They can't even blush at the sins that's being committed. In fact, people are proud of their sins. We live in that same generation. We pray and we say, God, what's happening to America? We see all the, the murder that's in our streets and the, and the swamps of discontent and the mosquitoes of crime that seem to be breeding and, and manifesting and growing day by day. And, and we see all the pornography. We see all the, the drug czars and the drugs. And we see all the dishonesty. We see all the greed. And we see all the materialism. We see all the racism. And we cry out to God. And we say, oh, God, you're the only one that can do anything about this. Please, God, come and do something. God, God, why don't you move? Why, why don't you bear your arm? Why don't we see your hand? And God doesn't seem to be doing anything. And Habakkuk said, God, where are you? God, don't you care? Why do you seem to be so indifferent? Why do you seem to be so inactive? And then thirdly, he said, why do you seem to be so inconsistent? I mean, his burden is not only caused by God's indifference and God's in inactivity, but also God's inconsistency. God finally does speak to him, and what God says in verses 5 and 6 Behold, ye among the heathens, he, look among the heathens and regard the wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told to you. For lo, I raised up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation which shall mark through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not heirs. So God is finally speaking, and Habakkuk does not like what God is saying. God says, All right. All right, Habakkuk, you, you've been screaming at me and arguing with me and crying out with me. I, I want you to know what I'm doing. You don't think I'm doing anything, but I am doing something to stop all of this crime and all this greed and all this violence. I I'm telling you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let it get worse. That's kind of shocking, isn't it? In fact, Habakkuk, Right at this very moment, I'm raising up a nation called the Chaldeans, which was nothing more than the Babylonians, and they're going to come, and they're going to overtake Israel. Their armies are going to be bitter. They're going to be cruel, which is the word for hasty there. 
They're going to be swift, which means they're going to march in on this land of Israel. They're going to take every place captive, and you're not going to be able to stop it. You're not going to believe. You would not even believe it if I told you what's getting ready to happen. And he didn't. Habakkuk didn't believe that. He wanted to argue with the Lord. If you look in verse 12, he says in verse 12, Art thou not the everlasting Lord? Lord, you're God Almighty. You didn't just get here yesterday. You're my holy God. You're the Holy One of Israel. And we shall not die. God, you've got it all mixed up. Israel's not the one that needs to be punished here. Oh, Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. Now, when he said that, now he's talking about the Babylonians. And, Almighty God, thou hast established them for correction. God, you certainly couldn't be talking about us. I mean, we're the chosen ones of Israel. God, we're the apple of your eye. We're the people of your choosing. Not us, O Lord. You're picking on the wrong crowd. Here's his rationale in verse 13. Thou art art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? So I want you to notice what the argument is. The argument is, God, you are inconsistent. God, I ask you to do something about the violence of the land. I ask you to do something about what's going on, the crime and everything that we see around us, the wickedness and the sickness of our land. And God, you tell me that you're going to bring the Babylonians Babylonians in to invade us. And God, that just doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't make sense to me. God, we may be bad, but we're not as bad as they are. How can you use the wicked to devour the men of God and the the women of God? uh, How can you? Lord, that's absolutely inconsistent. Just listen to me, Lord, and I'll tell you how you run your business. And God said, I told you you wouldn't believe it if I told you. That's the reason I haven't told you before, because you couldn't understand it. I have a lot of things to say to you, but you wouldn't have received them before now. You wouldn't have been able to bear them, he says in this text. How many of you know we don't live by explanations, but we live by the promises of God? God is not bound to you to explain one thing to you. God knows what he's doing. And God says, I'm raising up the Babylonians to bring them against you. And Habakkuk said, God, this cannot be so. I know we've sinned, but they're a lot worse than we are. You you know, this is not an old philosophy that he's saying here. This is a modern-day philosophy. And I will tell you one thing, and I'm, and I'm not a calamity cry, and I'm not one walking around saying the sky is falling. But you know, this, this is the philosophy. This is the way about 99% of all Americans believe right here. Oh, God, we're a great nation. We're a God-fearing nation. God, we've been this way for many years. We're bad. I mean, we have our crime, and we have our abortion, and we're aborting hundreds of thousands of babies every year, and, and we're, we're the most drug-addicted nation in the entire world, and we have our robberies, and we have our rapes, and we have our pride, and we have our materialism. But I'll tell you one thing. We stand at ball games and we sing, God bless America. And in some places, we still haven't taken off our corns, and God, we trust. We still have churches that that are across the landscapes of America. God, we're not like most nations of the world where it's even forbidden to to call your name in prayer. We may be bad, but we're not as bad as as they are. And because we're not as bad as they are, we're going to be safe. As long as we can have good leadership, strong national defense, and if we can just get a little revival in the stock market that dropped so drastically within the last couple of weeks, We're going to make it through until the rapture. We'll have bad times and and sometimes good times. But somehow, Lord, if we just hold on here in America, we're going to make it through to the rapture. And then we're going to be taken out of here. And that's the way most Americans feel. That's how they think about this nation. 
they're, they're hoping somehow back in their heart that everything is going to be fine. If we can just hold on till the rapture comes, then we're going to get out of here. Because you see, we're not like those Islamic nations that fly planes into the towers in New York. We don't do those cruel, horrible things. And, and we know deep in our heart that no matter what sin we commit, no matter what we live or how we live our lives, where we're not committed to God at all, and we just kind of make a show of the whole thing, a pretense of it all, that somehow God is still on our side. You say, Pastor Lover, I don't like you preaching like this. I don't like to preach like this. I don't like to preach like this. I've heard all of these TV preachers that tell me about the future of America. I've got to be honest, I've studied the Bible for a long time, and I don't see one shred of evidence, not one scripture that speaks of the Bible, of the superiority of America in the last days. Now, you can say what you want to and give the Bible a good old scriptural twist. It's not there. I'm praying that we will not be taken over by some Islamic nation. I'm praying that the Muslims will not come in and overrun America because of the, 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 the sickness and the malady and, 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 and just the anemic Christianity that's now existing in America. And, and because of that, they're making inroads in our colleges, in our schools, in every place. I'm working against that. I'm preaching against that. I'm standing against that. But I'm not here to tell you that that's absolutely going to happen if there is not a revival in this church, if there's not a revival in America. I want to believe God for a national revival. I want to believe God for a national deliverance. But I tell you, if revival does not come, I'm telling you, if people do not get right with God, if people do not repent, if God do not, if they do not trust God, if, if, if you do not have a new commitment to faithfulness in every degree of your life toward the things of God, then the Bible, it does not say that we're going to somehow be protected because at one time we were called a Christian nation. Do you know what the Bible says? For whomsoever much is given, to him much is required. We've been given a lot in this nation, and there's a lot that's required of us. And here it is in Scripture. God did allow an ungodly, perverse, degenerate nation that was Israel's worst nightmare to come in and to bring Israel to her knees. I pray to God that doesn't happen in America. We have a national calamity and our churches are filled. But you give it two weeks and the churches are empty again. We're stirred, but we're not changed. We're stirred, but we're not changed. I say this to you honestly. I believe America has been cursed with blessings. Can I say that again? Sad to say, but America has been cursed with blessings. One of these days, perhaps, we're going to be blessed with cursings. You say, Pastor Loper, what does that mean? Well, you know, we get out here and we say, Oh, God, bless us. Oh, God, turn this nation around. And, oh, God, save us from what happened at 9-11. And, oh, God, turn all that around. And suddenly God blesses us. And suddenly we have a little economic upturn. And, and suddenly we get all our, our 401Ks back. And we get all our money back. And we, we have a car in the garage again. We have a little money in the bank. And, and what, what happens? We go back to our immorality. We go back to our drugs. We go back to all of our sinfulness. We go back to all of our wayward ways, and we forget God. When God blesses this nation, we don't turn to Him. We become independent from Him. We go further and further away from Him. And I, I pray that it will not take a total, absolute disaster in America to drive us to our knees again and say, Oh God, come to us again. Do you realize what we owe China right now? Do you realize that your grandchildren are going to be paying China interest on what we owe them when they're adults 
Do you realize if we paid off our national debt today that every man, woman, boy, girl, baby in America would have to dole out $50,000 each? We're in debt! This nation is, is literally decaying. And I hate to say it, we're more interested in games. We're more interested in dancing with the stars and a football game on Saturday than we are national repentance of getting on our faces and saying, oh God, heal our land. Please don't walk out on me because I'm telling you folks, We've got to have a revival in this nation or this nation's going to be lost forever. It can no longer be that namby-pamby, maybe we will, maybe we want, yes we will, maybe we'll be here, maybe we won't be here. God's not necessarily in the business of protecting the American economy. God's not in the business of necessarily protecting American way of life. God's going to do whatever it takes to bring glory to himself. Oh, Pastor, I don't like this kind of preaching. I don't like it either. Habakkuk didn't like it. He had been praying, God, why don't you do something? Why don't you do something? Why are you so silent? And God said, Habakkuk, you don't know it. But I am doing something. I'm raising up the Chaldean army. In just a few days, they're going to come and take you over. You're talking about a burden to the prophet. Number one, God seemed to be indifferent. I cry and God doesn't hear me. Number two, God, you seem to be inactive. Number three, God, you seem to be inconsistent. You're inconsistent because, God, you seem to be... Why in the world, God, we're a God-fearing America. Our economy is bankrupt. And yet we see China and India and all these other pagan nations, they're exploding. Right now, they're exploding. This doesn't seem right to me, God. There's something's wrong with this picture, God. So that's what I want you to see. The first thing was this perplexing problem. And if you look, you'd have to have your head in the sand. You would have to be blind, deaf, and dumb not to know that this nation right now, this community, even Birmingham itself, is in a horrible situation today. Today! In a lot of different areas. It's deteriorating at its very fabric, its very roots, its very core. Something's wrong here, God. And then we come to the proper perspective. Chapter 2. Habakkuk said, I will stand up on my watch and set me up on my tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me, what I shall answer when I'm reproved. I thank God for this man. Suddenly he stops shouting at God and he starts listening to God. He has a watchtower out in the field and somewhere... In that place he's having his quiet time he climbed up into that tower and he got along with God he suddenly stopped telling God how to run the universe and he starts listening I'm just going to shut up for a while I'm going to listen to God I've given God too many instructions I've argued with God too long evidently God's not in the mood to argue with me I think I'm just going to sit down here and listen listen to what God has to say to me and suddenly God gave him a proper perspective. And I pray that today, and we, God doesn't want us to stick our head in the sand and act like it's not going on and be oblivious to what's going on around us. He wants to be aware of the problem, but God wants to give us his perspective. And I, I hope that before you leave here today, God will burn these truths in your heart, things that you should never forget and things that God wants to just indelibly stamp on your, your heart. First of all is the reliability of the Scripture. The reliability of the Scripture. In verse 2, And the Lord answered and said, Write the vision, just write it down, make it plain upon the tablets, meaning the tablets, that he may run that readeth it. Now he said to Habakkuk, uh, Habakkuk, I I'm going to show you something, I'm going to give you a vision, 
And when I give you this vision, I want you to write it down. Write it down. Make it very plain so that when somebody reads it, they're going to be able to run with the message. And, and, and what he wrote is right here. It's right here in the book of Habakkuk. What he was saying is, I'm not just writing this for you, and I'm not just writing this for Israel, but I'm writing this for Gary Wood Assembly of God in the year of 2011. I want to speak to their hearts this morning. I want you to write it down. I want you to make it plain what I'm getting ready to say. This is what he wrote right here. He wrote in that high tower, and he's writing. Because he knew that one day in Birmingham, Alabama, there were going to be some people just like you and I sitting in this building today that we would need this message. This is not just for what God said, but this is for what God is still saying. In other words, he wrote the message for us. I want you to listen to the message today. Listen to what he said in the prophecy, verse 3. For the vision is yet, appoint, is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come and it will not tarry. It will not tarry. What, what does that mean? It, 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 what he's saying here is God has made some sort of rock-ribbed eternal promises that are absolutely, totally sure. You can take it to the bank. You can trust the Word of God. And he says, now, between this beginning and the end, as we begin to move toward the end, there's going to be some things that are going to happen that's going to be very confusing. There's going to be times when you want to question God. There's going to be some time when you want to shout out at God. You want to to ask how and why and all of these things. He said, but I want you to look, Habakkuk, because I want you to write it down. Make it big. Make it plain. Make it straight. Make it true. Make it God's Word. You can trust God's Word. And when it seems like everything else is coming apart, and even when you don't understand it, I want you to write it in such a way that they'll know it's my Word in the darkest moments of my life that they'll be able to see me. See me and know it's true. I've got several books from F.B. Meyer in my, my, my library. He wrote in one of his books, If any promise of God should fail, the heavens would clothe themselves with sackcloth. The sun, the moon, and the stars would reel from their courses. The universe would rock, and, ho- and a hollow wind would moan through the ruined creation the awful message that God can lie. All of that would happen in just an instant. Suddenly, all of creation would go into this mournful cry, that the realization that God could lie. I'm here to tell you God cannot lie. I'm here to tell you I'm grateful to have this book in the day in which we live. I'm grateful to be able to turn to even to the pages of Habakkuk and and tell you that the message that he gives us today, it is not a lie. It is the truth. It will never return void. Harry, just wait for it. I know you don't understand. Still stand on it. Have faith in God. He's on the throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. I say unto you, have faith in God. The reliability of the Scriptures. And God says to me this week, I want you to take my word regardless of any circumstance that is in your life. And I want you to hold that word dear. I want you to trust it in the darkest moments of your life. Don't you dare get into appearances. Don't you dare get into circumstances. Don't you begin to say to yourself, well, evidently there's something wrong with these prophecies. Things are out of whack. Evidently God doesn't keep His Word. Uh, Maybe as the Scripture says in the back, that the whole earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. Maybe that's not true. Maybe what He said in Matthew 5, 5, where He said, maybe the meek, maybe they shall not inherit the earth. Maybe Jesus will not reign. Habakkuk said, let let me tell you something. Even if it doesn't seem to be happening at the moment in your life, you just wait. You just wait. There's a time and a season for all things. God cannot lie. God will not fail. God will eventually show himself to you. Believe in the reliability of the Word of God. God will come through for you. And the second thing he showed him was the retribution of the sinner. 
Habakkuk suddenly thought God had gone soft on sin. And uh, he said, look at those Babylonians, God. They don't need just a slap on the wrist. They need to be punished. And suddenly in verse 5, he begins to, chapter 2, verse 5, he begins to talk about the sinner. And he says, yea, also, because he hath transgressed by wine, he is a proud man, man, neither keepeth his home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and as, as is in death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Shall not all these take up a parable against him? an atoning proverb against him, and say unto him, Woe unto him. In verse 6, he says, Woe unto him. Verse 9, Woe unto him. Verse 12, Woe unto him. Verse 15, Woe unto him. Verse 19, Woe unto him. He's speaking of dishonesty. He's speaking of greed. He's speaking of violence. He's speaking of immorality. He's speaking of idolatry. He says, Woe unto those people. Habakkuk, you listen to me, my son. I know all about every one of these sins, and I'm going to judge every one of them. You may be in this building today, and I know I've heard preachers just recently of megachurches brag on the fact that they do not talk about sin anymore. I'm just telling you, if you're a sinner here today without Christ, don't you ever think for one instant, one split second, because God is not judging your sin right now, that you're not going to be judged for your sin. Don't you ever think that God's merely going to slap you on the wrist and let you somehow get by, by sin, with sin. These Babylonians coming down, look how they were coming down, high, wide, and proud, and handsome, and they were beginning to say to themselves, well, if he's God, well, he doesn't judge sin. Look what we're doing to his people. Uh, uh, I... God doesn't seem to be lifting his hand. God doesn't seem to be having any judgment against them. But God says, I have a record against every one of them. As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess the Lord Jesus Christ. I am here to tell you, my friend, as your friend, as your pastor, as the anointed minister of God standing behind this podium this morning, there's not one scintilla of sin that will go overlooked. It will be judged by the Almighty God. And don't you listen to anybody else that preaches anything else. You listen to me this morning. As Longfeller said, the mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. God's judgment doesn't always come on Friday, but it always comes. God will have a payday someday. What was the next thing he showed him? He first of all showed him the reliability of the Scripture. You can bank on it. Number two, he showed him the retribution of the sinner. Thirdly, he showed him the reign of the Savior. The Lord's going to rule. Let all the pundits, TV pundits, all the naysayers, the atheists. I saw this deal the other night where Bill Maher, I think his name was, made, made this fun of religion and God and all the preachers, and especially evangelicals. Oh, he's so arrogant and so, so, so arrogant and so shameful what he was. In fact, I tried to watch a little of it. Sharon said, please turn that off. I don't even want that. I don't even want that spoken in my house. Get it out of here. We could feel the evilness coming through the tube. Get it out of here. I don't want to hear it. I'm telling you, there's coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. You put a star by it. You thank God for it. Habakkuk, the second chapter, the 14th verse. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's a beautiful promise. When you look around Birmingham and you see all the crime and you see all the hate, you look around this nation, you see the disorganization, you see the disintegration, everything seems to be coming apart. We, we look at our world, we see what's happening in Palestine once again, and we just see a world that's filled with war and strife. I'm here to tell you this morning, just as surely as my name is John Loper, as surely as I'm standing in this pulpit this morning, as surely as there's a God in heaven, Jesus, you write it down in your book, Jesus will be victorious. He will be victorious. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth as it is in heaven. 
Let all the forces of hell, let all the powers of sin, all the doubts of people, let them say what they want to. They want for one second stop the enthronement of our dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Just wait for it. Tarry for it. Just wait for it. Though it tarry, it'll come. What was that great hymn that was written many years ago? Some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. It might be today. In fact, I sat this morning and said, Lord, why don't you just make it today? We're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. Just wait on it. He, he, he can't lie. We have the reliability of the Scripture. It's going to be done. Let me tell you, that's something you can hold on to. You're going to go through a lot of things you don't understand. A lot of things that you don't know. You just need to get on your high tower and stop shouting at God. Stop arguing with God. And just say, God, I want to listen to you. I just want to be still and know that you're still God. Let me just know that you're still God. And then the third thing I want you to see this morning, and I'm going to close. The first thing was the perplexing problem. The second thing was the proper perspective. The third thing was his profound praise. Boy, in the third chapter of Habakkuk, he reaches the pinnacle of the highest praise that I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen higher praise or more wonderful, pure, pristine praise than I've seen that's found in the third chapter of Habakkuk. It is absolutely profound to me. Now, I want you to notice it begins with a prayer of Habakkuk, the, prop, the prophet on Signanoff. Signanoff. We're not, we're not real sure what that word means. Some think it's a musical term. But most commentaries agree that I read that it's a, he, it's a Hebrew word that says when you sing this praise or when you give this praise, you want to do it with deep, deep emotion. And the word there that is upon, it means according to. When you do this, do it according to deep emotion, according to deep feeling. And so what's happening here, he's thought of all the, the greatness of God, the power of God, and, and he says, now I'm going to pray a prayer and sing a prayer that's not going to be just an ordinary prayer. It's going to be done with deep, deep feeling. His eyes are brimming with tears. He says, I want, I, I want to say what I'm feeling and what I've seen. He says, I want to share with other people how you can praise God on dark days. I, when you don't understand, when there's a lot of things don't make sense, and it seems like the heavens are brass, and it seems like God is inactive and indifferent, then, then, then I, I want to sing this prayer, or pray this prayer of deep feeling. And, and the Signanoff prayer is a praise that is rooted in revelation. It's rooted in revelation. You see, when God gave Habakkuk this revelation, it was not just a revelation of the situation. It was a re revelation of himself. And that's what we need. It's not about what God's doing. It's about who God is. And, and I don't know about you, but that's far more important. Uh, God couldn't explain to us what he's doing anyway. The Bible says his ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. It says in Isaiah 55, as high as the heavens are above the earth are his ways above our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts. And here's the thing that I've come to the conclusion. It's a lot more important to me when I'm going through a crisis in my life to know who rather than what. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When I'm walking through a crisis and things are out of control, it's a lot more important for me to know who than why. Many times we get in trouble and we say, why, God? If you could just explain it to me, God, I'd feel a lot better. And sometimes if God did try to explain it to us, we'd feel worse. We'd say, God, that's not the way I would do it. In fact, that's not the way I want it. Oh, God, do it the way that I've, I've described to do it. So God doesn't explain to us. He doesn't always show himself to us. But here's where this prophet got a revelation of God. 
And let me just show you something that's very sweet and very beautiful. I, I, I'm going to move very quickly here. Habakkuk, the third chapter and the third verse, it says, God came from Teman and the Holy One came from Mount Paran, Selah. You need to put a circle around that word Selah. That's a strange word, isn't it? What does it mean? It says, The bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribe, even thy word, Selah. Draw a, word, a circle around that word, Selah. Verse 13, Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for the salvation of thy anointed, and, and woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation upon the neck, Selah. What does that word, Selah, mean? He uses it over and over. When David was writing his psalm, all of a sudden he would say, and it's, it's there several times, and by the way, this is the only book in the Bible where you'll find the word Selah other than Psalms in Habakkuk. Only two places, the Psalms and Habakkuk. So what does he mean? Some people say it's an indication like when you're, you know, music is according to timing and then you have a rest. You have a rest. So what the psalmist is saying, it's like a rest in music. Pause and think about it. Just think about it. Selah, meditate upon that. And here's the prophet saying, I'm going to praise God with deep emotion. I'm so excited. And what did he say in verse 3? He said there was a revelation of God's majesty. He came from Paran and Teman. That's where the law was given. And, and, and then in verse 9, he mentions the rainbow. Uh, that was the story of God's mercy. In other words, God's a merciful God. God keeps His covenant. His mercy is renewed every morning like the morning of dew. And, and then he goes on to speak of God's might and God's majesty, God's mercy. And, and he, when he talks about all of this, he says, I just want you to know that I have a God who rules over everything. He's in charge. He loves you. And he said, Selah, just, just take a rest. When, it, when your world is out of control and things are going haywire, just stop for a moment and say, Selah. Let me meditate upon the fact that David Wilkerson was not lying when he said God had every, has everything under control. God has everything under control. He has it under control. What I'm saying to you, when he spoke to Habakkuk, it was not a revelation about the situation that he found himself in with Babylonians. It was a revelation of who God was. And that's what some of you need. You could calm down a little bit. You could get quiet in your spirit if you could just see who God is. Sometimes we don't know the Lord. We get our eyes on circumstances. We get our eyes on situations. We get our eyes on adversary. And we don't know God. You see, I believe that praise is rooted in revelation. It understands that even though you don't understand, that God understands. Do you know there's no panic in heaven? There's only praise. There's no panic in heaven. Listen to what it says at the end of the chapter, chapter 2. The Lord is in His holy temper, temple. Let all the earth keep silent before Him. Would you just see God today in heaven? God is not panicking. He's not. Let me tell you, the Babylonians may come down and invade the temple down here, but they can't invade the temple up there. Quit arguing with God. Quit trying to tell God how to run His universe. God is in control. He has never lost control. He has the hairs on your head numbered. There's not a blade of grass that blows in the wind that God doesn't know about it. There's not a grain of sand upon the seashores, the Gulf shores, or even this earth that God doesn't know the exact size, shape, dominion, dimension, and knows the location of every grain of sand on the face of this earth. God's in his holy temple so he says think about his mercy think about his majesty think about his might and then praise recognizes reality reality some people say you Christians are so strange you you just stick your head in the sand act like things are not as bad as they are and that's not true this is not a Pollyannish kind of gospel where we we say well that's not true and we don't do that we know some situations are bad. When you look at verse 16, he said, When I heard my belly tremble, my lips quivered at my voice, rottenness entered into my bones, I trembled in myself. And he said, I could not rest day or night from the trouble. And 
you can translate that any way you want to. He was scared stiff. He says, when I think about what's going to happen, it, it makes my stomach churn. It, it makes me tremble. My lips tremble. It makes my bones turn to water, to rottenness. He, I'm a realist. He said, I, it's not like I'm trying to avoid what's going on. I'm not some kind of sentimental optimist, but I'm not a pessimist either. Dark days may come, but here's what I want you to see. Here's what he said in the end. Over everything and anything that happens in your life, I've seen the God of glory. I've seen this earth of everything that's happening, but I want to tell you God's in control. And out of that reality, there comes rejoicing. See, praise has its roots in revelation. It, has its, it, it recognizes reality. And then finally, praise always results in rejoicing. And if you were to ask me today, what is one of your most, it's kind of hard to pick one. But if you, you were to ask me today, Pastor Loper, what is possibly your most favorite scripture in all the Word of God? It's verses 17 through 19. Listen to it. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall there be fruit in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet, yet, such a small word with such a powerful meaning. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall be fruit on the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail. The field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. There shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet, put a big circle around that word, yet. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength, and he will make my feet to be like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon my high places. God's going to see me through. God's going to pull me through if I can just stand the pull. Doesn't make any difference. Don't matter if the stock market tumbles. Doesn't matter if there's anything on the shelves of the, stock, uh, of the supermarkets. Doesn't matter if there's any food on the shelves there. It, it, it just don't matter. It doesn't matter if you don't even have money to buy it. It doesn't matter if there's no jobs listed in the want ads. It doesn't matter if the war is imminent and and we hear every day it's not a matter of, of when, but it's just whenever it's going to happen with the terrorists because it's going to happen. Let me tell you something. Habakkuk said, I lifted my eyes above all of that. I saw the majesty, the might, the power of God, and I said, God, you're in control. I want everybody in this building to stand today. Would you just, would you just lift your voices with me? Mm. America needs revival. We need revival. We've got to have people that will look above the crisis. Look above all the despair. Look above all the, the, the things that are happening all around us. And say, God, you're God. You're God. It's five after. But if you'll give me five minutes, I promise you I'll let you go in five minutes. Where's your joy? Where's the joy of your salvation? Can you be joyful in your circumstances? Can you be joyful in the crisis that you're walking through right now? The joy of the Lord is your strength. I've tried to tell you today how to make it in a mess. How to stay together when the world's coming apart. And I want to tell you something. I don't believe it's going to get a lot better. I think it's going to get worse. And you better, you better, you better hold to God's unchanging hand. I want you to come and join me in this altar. Very quickly. Very quickly. Very quickly. Don't wait. Come quickly. Come quickly.